you're going to be bountifully blessed by God's word. I greet you with the words of Psalm 134, 1 and 2, which says, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Last week, we webcast live from Houston, Texas. This week, we webcast live from Washington, D.C. That's right, our nation's capital. And I ask that you would please invite somebody to join in with us as we deal with this subject tonight. And the subject matter, of course, is entitled, Is Having Weight Loss Surgery a Sin? Now, listen, because we're broadcasting from a whole, webcasting from a whole different uh, place all together. Be sure to hit those hearts and make some comments and let me know that you're listening. Elder Johnson, I see you. Want to make sure that you hear me wonderfully loud and clear. And I thank God again for each and every one of you that thank you for those hearts that tune in. God bless you, Brother Gantz, all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada. I tell you, I'm just excited about what God is doing. On yesterday, we were in the beautiful city of Wichita, Kansas with Bishop and Lady Gilkey and the uh, Kansas Southwest jurisdiction, how God blessed and moved. My subject on yesterday was the importance of the preacher. My God. And tonight, 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 we will be preaching here at the New Bethel Church of God in Christ in the city of Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, our nation's capital. And tonight we'll be ministering from the subject, Satan has some power. But God has all power. My God, if you know anybody that is in the D.C. area or in the Maryland area or Virginia area, invite them and encourage them to come and to be a part of this service. We're at 6440 uh, Piney Branch Road in the city of Washington, D.C. And I tell you, we've been on the road. That's right. Even our most holy mug with the most holy water has been right here with us. And we're so appreciative of all of what God is doing. God is blessing. The next three nights, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we will be here in D.C. in revival. And then on Friday night, if you're in St. Louis, join us at the Williams Temple Church of God in Christ, where the Bishop Lawrence M. Wooten is the pastor and bishop and general board member. We will be preaching for him in the first night of his holy convocation. And then after that, on Saturday, we'll be heading to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 20 different jurisdictions in the next couple months. I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. I thank God for the prayers of my family. I thank God for five-hour energy drink. And I thank God for Most Holy Diet Pepsi that is helping me to do all of this. And so we're going to pray and go directly into the Word of God. I won't hold you a long time tonight, but tonight we want to deal with weight loss surgery, tummy tucks, uh, body shapers, <laughs> implants, feet work, teeth work, facelifts. What else are we going to deal with right quickly? We're going to deal with Botox, getting rid of all of those wrinkles, false eyelashes, colored contact lenses, hair dye, wigs, toupees, extensions, all of that. We're going to deal with that tonight and see what the Word of God says. Someone said, really, is all of that going on? You'd be surprised the number of people that are having weight loss surgery. And I get all kinds of questions from all across the country uh, and from other parts of the world. And I thank God for each and every one of you. I'm excited. Even the Board of Bishops of the Church of God in Christ have asked me to come. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing in Milwaukee. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, teaching in the Board of Bishops. They have asked me to serve as an instructor uh, in the Church of God in Christ to the Board of Bishops. Oh, I see you saying stay away from those sodas. That's another lesson. Is it a sin to drink soda? Um, but we're excited because they've asked us to come in and talk about godliness and holiness. And it's just a blessing that people across the country and around the world are tuning in and hearing us. Listen, before we go into the lesson, don't forget that the AIM convention is coming up July 1st through the 5th. Make sure that you register under the International Department of Evangelism. Also, the annual convocation of Missouri Midwest jurisdiction will be taking place the 21st through the 26th. Renee Winston will be with us, Paul S. Morton, J. Drew Shear, Joyce Rogers, Todd Hall, and so many others. People are committing to coming from across the country to be a part of this great aggregation of God's people. Well, listen, as I go into the Word, be sure to follow, be sure to like, be sure to share, and subscribe. Follow me as I follow Christ. Hit that follow button. Hit that subscribe button. Share this lesson right now with someone that needs to find out because there are so many people 
that are struggling with their weight, and we want to see what God would say. So, Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word and bless us as we go into the pages of your word and give your people uh, guidance from the word. God, we know that only you can give us the guidance that we need, and we pray that you would bless us with that wisdom and that direction. We ask in Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. Again, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to share. I am broadcasting, webcasting live from the New Bethel, the historic New Bethel Church of God in Christ in Washington, D.C. Last week's program was from Houston, Texas. Tonight we're in Washington, D.C., and we ask that if you are in this area, please come and join us at 6440 Piney Branch Road. We have some powerful messages that God has given us. Uh, uh, last night we talked about in Wichita, Kansas, the importance of the preacher. Tonight we're going to be dealing with the subject matter. Satan has some power, but God has all power. I have another message that we'll be preaching this week here in this revival. If I could be a fly on the wall, my God, you want to come and hear what God is saying. So let's go into this tonight. Is any kind of cosmetic surgery a sin, whether it is tummy tucks, whether it's implants, feet, work, teeth work, facelifts, um, etc. And somebody asked about the feet. They said, what do you mean about the feet? There are people that actually get constructive surgery done uh, on their feet in order that their feet can be improved as far as its appearance. appearance. Now listen, the Bible does not specifically address surgery really at all. However, there are some principles from the Word of God that each and every one of us need to pay close attention to uh, before we would do something major like having surgery. Realize this, many times people have surgery because they want to feel good about themselves. And there's nothing wrong with wanting you, with you desiring to feel good about yourself. But the thing is, when society begins to place upon you what is considered beautiful, what is considered handsome, and what is not. And as a matter of fact, some people have been bullied all their life in regard to their weight or in regard to their looks. And so they figure now, because of all of what these people have done, what I'm going to do I'm going to make some improvements upon myself. Well, here's the thing. People can be very wicked. People can be wicked in how they talk to you. People can be wicked in how they talk about you. You want to make sure that before you do anything major like having surgery, because that's something major, the, the, the worst effect that can come from surgery is death itself. The doctors will warn you the line. God bless your heart from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, they're calling right now, trying to find out, can I have surgery? Well, just, just listen. We'll share with you from God's Word. And what we're saying is this. Be led of God. Don't be led by trying to impress people. Realize this. People are going to feel what they feel about you, whether you have surgery or not, whether you have a facelift or not, whether you do your hair a certain way or not, whether you move to a certain part of town or not. There are people literally wearing themselves out with debt and wearing themselves out, trying to be in a certain part of town, drive a certain kind of car, wear a certain kind of clothes, go certain kind of places because they want to impress people that are never really going to like you in the first place. And why would you put yourself up under that kind of stress? So if, something, if it's something that God has uh, led you to do, if it's something that God has given you the okay to do, you may be saying, well, God would lead me to do something like that. Well, I would think something major like having surgery, you would want to find out what God would tell you and lead you and guide you to do. Romans 8, 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Blessings to you also. Uh, listen, Acts 20, 23 through 24, Paul was the type of person, he had confidence in his God within him. And uh, I'm not trying to talk like Reverend Ike or anything like that, but God is in you. If you abide in him and his word abides in you, you can ask what you will. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So Christ in us, the hope of glory, should give us the confidence that we need that in spite of what people say, we're able to stand and we're able to make sound and wise choices. You know, do you have surgery? Do you pay your bills? Do you have surgery to impress people, or do you go on with your life and feel good about yourself based on who God has created you to be? Paul said in Acts 20, 23 through 24, I care less what people think. He says, except the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions, they await me. But I do not consider my life of any account 
is dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. The King James literally says, none of these things move me. I'm not moved by what people say. I'm not moved by what people think. And again, people can be very, very cruel. But what you want to make sure is that you're not carrying any type of weight and baggage from your childhood. Well, Hankerson, I'm 50 years old. And when I was in elementary school, come on, you're 50 years old and you're still struggling with something that happened in elementary school. Yes, those things can hurt. Yes, those things can wound your spirit, but it's time to move on. A lot of a lot of times those people that have said all kinds of things about you, they've moved on with their life. They may not even remember who you are. And here you are trying to impress someone that can't even remember your name. They don't even remember who you are. So anything major like surgery, like trying to get a facelift, implants, getting your teeth done, getting your feet done, your, your, your teeth are crooked, and trying to straighten those out, trying to get a tummy tuck and scrape all of the fat out and all of those kinds of things, make sure you are led of God. And again, not led by what people think. Nothing like surgery should be taken lightly. It's serious. Again, the worst side effect is death itself. And I'm not going to sit up here and try to give you medical advice because I'm not a doctor. I can't give you that. I'm not that kind of doctor. I'm a theological doctor, but not a medical doctor. But uh, here's one thing I will tell you. Your body does not belong to you. If you are saved, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't own your body. So God must give you peace and direction before you do anything concerning some type of major renovation in regard to your temple. I used to pastor in Springfield, Missouri, and evangelist Devonna Reeder is on the line. She was a member of that church, and I have so many friends that tune in from way back when. I mean, from elementary school and junior high and all, and it's just a blessing and privilege. Uh, people that each, actually I've known even um, from my childhood in my church, and I, I thank God, my childhood church that I grew up in in the state of Washington. And so we have to understand this. We have to understand this. Uh, evangelist Reeder can, attestify, can testify that when I was pastoring the Timmons Temple Church of God in Christ, it was owned by Memphis, Tennessee. Now, don't get that wrong. Every church of God in Christ is not owned by Memphis, Tennessee. That's a whole story within itself. But this particular church was a historic church that was started in 1919, I believe that it was, built in 1932. So it was owned by the National Church. And even though I was the pastor of the church, because it was owned by the National Church, and because um, the, the bishop was actually the pastor of the church, uh, because it was a historic um, building, even though we had the money, we had to get permission before we could actually do renovations on that church. We could not do renovations until we got permission to do that. So it's the same way when it comes to your body. Your body is not owned by you. Your body is owned by God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, you must get God's direction. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, whom you receive from God, and you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So one thing you want to make sure as I do this, am I glorifying myself or am I glorifying me? Am I bringing attention to myself or am I bringing attention to God? Somebody may say, well, what's wrong with me bringing attention to myself? Well, all attention should go towards God. All attention should go towards glorifying him because again, our body belongs to him. Here's what the scripture also says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord. With all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. So literally what that is saying here is that we should not lean to what we think. A lot of times people say, well, I don't see nothing wrong with this, or my opinion is that, or my opinion is this. Listen, I've given you two passages of Scripture. First of all, your body doesn't belong to you. And secondly, he says, don't lean to your own understanding. So let's see what God would say. And we also have to be careful about quick fixes. You know, I have people that listen across the world, not just in the United States, but in the western part of the world, in the United States of America, we always want these quick fixes. We want something quick. We want something fast. We want something in a hurry. When we go to McDonald's, if they take longer than three minutes to get a quarter pounder, when you uh, take longer than three minutes, we're honking the horn. What is going on? Now, you know good and well, if you want something that's good and healthy to eat, it's going to take a whole lot longer than any three minutes. But we want everything quick, fast, and in a hurry. In a hurry. Surgery will do no good if our mindset and our lifestyle does not change. 
the fruit of the Spirit consists of self-control, and we must allow the Holy Ghost to have free course in our lives and to produce discipline. And again, don't allow all of what society says is beautiful, what society says is handsome, influence you. There's a lot of you may have been struggling with your weight. Now, I don't necessarily struggle with weight, but uh, at one time I had a whole... I had, a moderate weight, and then I gained a whole bunch of weight because I just didn't care. I'd eat big old donuts at 12 midnight if it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I had a taste for some smothered pork chops and some rice and some green beans. I'd get up and make that at 2 o'clock in the morning and sweet potato pie and uh, all of that and pound cake. And so, I mean, just just swole up, just swole up. And then um, about 13 years ago, started exercising a whole lot and um, uh, eating salad and yogurt and, and soup, and I went down real small to the point that folks said, is he sick? What's going on? You know, people will talk about you. Listen, let me tell you what. Folks are going to talk about you no matter what. If you're obese, they're going to talk. If you're fat, they're going to talk. If you're skinny, they're going to talk and say something is wrong. You must be sick. Is he dying? And so I remember all of that, and I said, now, God, I can't live off of just salad and yogurt and soup. And so one of, one of my things that has just really been a horrible temptation. I really try to stay away from that. That's those starches. That is those starches. I'm talking about spaghetti. My God, I'm talking about mashed potatoes. I'm talking about, like I said, seven up pound cake and all of that. But again, people will, will talk and they'll say all kinds of things, but you must realize that you are a child of God and your beauty and your handsomeness is determined by God. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the inward appearance. Now, you don't want to get to the point you don't have any pride in yourself. You don't groom yourself. You don't take care of yourself. You don't care. Like I said, you know, a number of years ago, I don't care what I eat. You don't want to be like that because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So you got to be careful what you place in your body. Now, yes, I love to drink the sodas and things like that, but I make sure, hey, let me get my water also. Make sure that you take up enough water. So you see the Holy Mug has followed me all the way from St. Louis to Houston, Texas to D.C. and wherever else that I'm going. And so we don't want surgery to be a quick fix because we don't have self-control. The fruit of the Spirit consists of self-control. 2 Peter 1, 5 and 6. Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So that's what we want to make sure that we have is self-control. You never want to be the type of person goes to the buffet, and I mean, you just, hey, hey, I don't care. Wave your hands in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. I'm going five or six times to the buffet. You know, that's just, and then have the nerve to sit back, loosen your belt and belch and all those kind of things. That may seem funny to you, but gluttony, really gluttony is just about a sin <laughs> as anything else. When you overdo anything, it is definitely, I'm not saying it's a sin, but it's definitely has to be close to it. Uh, because again, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So is God against Botox? Is God against all these kind of things? Along with treatment for certain health conditions, Botox can be used to reduce wrinkles. And cultures of every age have been trying to find the fountain of youth. You know, people hit the midlife crisis. You'll have a man get in his mid-40s and go out and buy a sports car and get a toupee and open up your shirt and have all those raggedy gray chest hair showing and everything, just making a plum fool of yourself. You know, the Bible honors old age. The Bible honors old age. It's an honor to get old. It's a blessing to get old. The Bible doesn't speak against Botox, but it does honor age. And according to the Bible, getting old is actually a blessing and it's not a curse. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth, which the Lord your God has given you. Psalm 91, 16, with a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Proverbs 16, 31, a gray head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. Now, am I saying that it is a sin for uh, the brothers and the sisters to dye their hair? Because I tell you what, uh, in the sanctified church, you, you want to see some dyed hair, you will see it amongst uh, those in the sanctified church, male and female. <laughs> raggedy, yeah, raggedy. Uh, you know, I got a little sense of humor. But uh, 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 
it, it's a blessing to have gray hair. I got a few gray hairs right here and all of that. It's a blessing to have that. That's a blessing from God. And the scripture really looks at it as a sign of wisdom. Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is their strength, and the honor of old men is their gray hair. My God, that's a great passage. Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is their strength. And for those of you trying to find out what, tra what translation is he... Um, Reading from, I'm actually reading from the New American Standard Bible, as I've told you before, the most accurate translation of the scripture is the New American Standard Version. Uh, Pastor Michael Gantz, I don't know what Beijing Vision is. You're going to have to explain that to me. I've never heard of Beijing Vision. So uh, uh, please explain that to me, and um, I'll try to answer that as best as I possibly can. But the New American Standard Version actually is the most uh, accurate translation when it comes to the original text without you having to know Hebrew and know uh, Greek. So that's the version I'm reading from. But that's a powerful passage in Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is their strength, and the honor of old men is their gray hair. You know, so as, as we get older and things begin to sag, you know, at one time you're walking around and everything is up here as a man, and whoop, it drops down. Here, you know, gravity starts pulling you down. Hey, the honor of old men is their gray hair. That is a part of life. You know, it is a part of life to, oh, it's a hair dye. Um, okay, yeah, because I didn't know what that was. It's a hair dye. I don't, um, well, the scripture doesn't talk, bless you, Administrative Assistant Warren Doors. The scripture doesn't talk about against um, dyeing your hair. And I'm going to deal with that scripture in a few minutes that says you can't make one hair black or white. Um, if people do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. The scripture doesn't really uh, talk against it, but it does talk against it. It does talk about the fact that it's an honor to have gray hair. You know, you get older, you start, you all see I have these little spots here, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably going to do it one day. I'm probably going to do it one day. Give me just a few years. I'm probably going to do it. Go out and get that most holy toupee and wear that and embarrass all of you all. Say, I am your internet evangelist. I am your international president of the Department of Evangelism in my sanctified toupee. My God, shout glory, and the thing comes off. My God. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people do things, again, to feel good about themselves, but you want to make sure you're not vain. You want to make sure you're not doing things for the wrong motive. Now, if you're doing something to, to beautify the temple, um, you know, so be it. But if you're doing something because you're trying to make yourself a sex symbol, you know, something is wrong with your motive in the first place. But Isaiah 46 and 4 says, even to your old age, I will be the same. Even to the grain of your hairs, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you. So with that in mind, Hankerson, what, 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 is, the, um, what is the case? Psalm 119, 104 says, God hates every false way. So what about false eyelashes, colored contact lenses, hair dye, wigs, extensions, all these false things? Is that um, a, a, a sin? Uh, the, the late Pastor Blake, not Bishop Blake, uh, not Bishop Charles Blake, our presiding bishop, but another Blake, told the story of this gentleman that got married. And uh, his wife was just so beautiful and all. And they got home the night of the um, honeymoon. And when they got home, she took off the false eyelashes, took off the false hair, false chest, false seat, false everything, false colored uh, uh, contact lenses, took it all and threw it in the drawer. The man said, my God, I don't know whether to jump into bed or jump in the drawer. I don't know which one to do. But uh, the scripture says God hates every false way. And so, bless you, thank you for joining me before uh, uh, your choir rehearsal. So, is that a sin? Is that a sin? Now, there are some people, there are some brothers will tell you, they don't like a, a lady to be fake. You know, they don't like a lady to um, have all of those fake things. There are some people that have, and it was mentioned on some of the comments, and I see a lot of the comments. I don't always get to come back and uh, respond. I would love to, but there's uh, just so many comments. I'm not able to respond to everyone. But someone has stated that some people have medical conditions, and so they have to wear wigs and things like that. The Bible obviously does not address false eyelashes, colored contact lenses, hair dye wigs, extensions, uh, or things like that. Of course, I have an issue if I see men wearing those. You know, why? Why would a man? Uh, be wearing all of those things. There's a difference between male and female. Male and female created he, him. You know, males carry ourselves a certain way. Females carry themselves a certain way. And I'm not hating on anybody, but I'm drawing that distinction. I will not compromise on that. God distinctively made male and female. 
But the following texts in the scripture are not referring to wigs and false eyelashes and uh, dyed hair. You all are getting after me about that toupee. I'm going to get that most holy toupee and, and wear that for you. Psalm 119, 104, from, from your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. See, the Proverbs are dealing, and the Psalms a lot of times, because Psalms and Proverbs are really poetic um, uh, uh, literature, that's a comparison and a contrast. So I love your word. I love getting understanding from your word, your precepts, your laws, and therefore I hate everything that is not in accordance with your word. That's all that that is saying. He's not talking about false eyelashes and things like that. My, Matthew 5, 36 says, Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Uh, again, that's a comparison and a contrast. And what Jesus is referring to there, he's not referring to, what did you say, um, Pastor Gantz, whatever that hair dye is, he's not referring to hair dye. That scripture has nothing to do with hair dye. Literally what that is referring to is the fact that you cannot make any type of uh, uh, changes. You shall not make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair uh, white or make one hair black. You can't do it. Now, you can dye it, but it doesn't mean that you actually can grow black hair. If the hair is coming out gray, it's coming out gray, and you can dye it and change it, but you cannot, uh, if it's going to come out gray, you can't change it and make it come out black. You don't have that kind of control. Only God has that kind of control, and that's what the text is dealing with. It is not dealing with um, hair dyes and all. So I'm not going to send everybody to hell for that, but what will send you to hell is the wrong motive. If you're trying to catch people's attention, why do you want so much attention? Why, why is it that when you walk in the church, you want everybody to look at you? Why is it that when you walk into the family reunion or go back to the uh, school reunion, your class reunion, why is it that you want everybody to look at you? If you love God and if you're supposed to be glorifying Him, you know, why would you want that? You'd be surprised the people that in church um, that are supposed to be Christians, supposed to be saints, that really try to draw attention to themselves. You know, wear things as short and as revealing as they possibly can. And I'm not just talking about uh, the females, because for years in church we have beat up on the women, but the thing is, you're not supposed to be having a lust spirit. You know, if you're a man, you're not supposed to be having a, a, a lust spirit in the first place. You're supposed to have your mind uh, set upon God, and God gives you that kind of self-control that you can live a holy and righteous life. Are you absolutely, totally perfect? No, I don't know anybody that's absolutely, totally perfect, but I tell you what, you got to strive towards it. you got to go towards it. you got to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. You've got to be able to stand. But um, if you're a lady or a man, why would you want to draw attention to yourself? I mean, if you're a lady, why would you want your bosom out? Why would you want your legs and private areas all out and everything like that if you are a godly person? If you're a man, why would you want your jewels all out? Why would you wear your pants so tight that all your jewels are hanging out and, and, and people are supposed to be focused on the word, you know, and they're, you know, folks, they ain't supposed to be looking. Well, why would you put the, you know, stuff out in the first place? That's wrong. The wrong intention, the wrong motives. And, and you're, you're causing people to stumble. And the Bible said, well, they should, should be right. Yeah, they should be right. Yeah, but why would you put temptation in front of somebody? Uh, you know, something like that definitely comes from Satan. And time is out for church being so much of a show. You know, it's become so much of a show. It's become so much of a production. You go and you watch somebody on the stage, and they do the show, and shazam! And then you get done with the show in an hour and a half, and you leave out, and you're still just as bound up and confused and mixed up as when you went in there. There ought to be a difference. And so a worship experience is about experiencing God, not, not seeing flesh, not some kind of flesh show. Uh, the Bible refers to how God symbolically decked his people out and made them beautiful. He says in Ezekiel 16, 11, and 12, I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hands and necklaces around your neck. I put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Now, that's something right there, these nose rings and all. God said, I put a nose ring in your nostril. Now, that's kind of nasty to me, but, you know, that's what he said. Hey, I put a, and people wear nose rings and all of that kind of thing. And I think you're getting kind of a little off when you start putting it on your tongue and two or three on your ears and all. You can just overdo anything and make yourself uh, just just look like a, a clown. And so we, we should uh, 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 take care of ourselves, groom ourselves. You know, you don't have to have the most expensive, but take your bath, brush your teeth, you know, make sure that your teeth are clean. Don't be all up in people's face and your breath is uh, sinful and offensive. Um, you should have some kind of pride in yourself. That, that's, that's really what lets you know that the person is living when they have that kind of pride to get up in the morning and, 
bathe themselves and take care of themselves, comb their hair. You may not have a whole bunch of hair on your head, but what you have, you comb it and you take care of yourself. But just don't overdo things and become so where you're trying to make somebody fall. It's fine to smell good, but what you don't want to do, you don't want to sit up there and put so much uh, stuff on you that, you know, you're trying to attract people. What they say, honey draws bees and all of that. You don't want to try to attract people You want in that particular manner. You want people to see you, or you should want people to see you as a man or woman of God, whether you're a preacher or not. And uh, for those of you that are in the, um, not in Christianity, I know you see so much. And what gets me is people in the world they know what Christians are supposed to be doing. They know how Christians are supposed to be living. But it's the people within the church that want to compromise so much. So God is against vanity and trying to draw attention to yourself. God values character and godliness over good looks. First Samuel 16 and 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look on the outward appearance. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Second Corinthians 4.18, For while the things... Uh, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. First Timothy 4 and 8, for bodily discipline is only a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promises for the present life and for the life to come. First Peter 3, 1 through 4, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. I'm going to deal with a lesson on that in the future. Wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. Oh, that's going to be an explosive one. It says, so if any of them don't believe, they be, may be won without a word by your behavior. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold, jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. See, people have taken those scriptures and said, see, you're not supposed to wear gold, you're not supposed to wear jewelry, you're not supposed to braid your hair. Listen, ugliness is not holiness, all right? Homeliness is not holiness. Put that in the comment section. Ugliness is not holiness. Homeliness is is not holiness. A lot of people think the more homely I am, the more raggedy I dress, the more raggedy I look, the more raggedy I act, the more godly I am. No, you're just pitiful. <laughs> you're not going to draw anybody. Pitiful doesn't draw anybody. Presiding Bishop Blake stated this, God doesn't do pitiful. I mean, when you look at heaven, it is, and when you look at the new Jerusalem, it's, it's, it's excellence. God is a God of order. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. Everything he does is in excellence, and so we shouldn't be raggedy, um, and even if you don't have the most expensive whatever, take care of what you have. Take care of yourself and have some kind of pride in yourself, regardless if you got one dress, if, you, if you're a lady, if you got one suit, you know, if you're a man, it doesn't matter. Take care of that and just move on and do what you have to do. Um, but, but, but realize this, just purposely being raggedy and homely. I remember time, you know, saints wouldn't put on anything, and it seemed like they didn't put on deodorant, either. You know, stinkiness is not holiness. It is not holy and godly to be stinky, especially we do, you know, in, <laughs> in holiness, we, we do a lot of, um, you know, we, we jump and move and run and after all that screaming and hollering and carrying on and sweating and all. And if you haven't uh, put on any deodorant, your breath is smelling. I mean, that's why the, 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 the church is kind of sometimes smell a little musty. And so we have to take care of ourselves. All right, let's 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 get ready. It's getting hot in here. Let's 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 look at this. Um, is it wrong for men to wear girdles or for anyone to wear a body shaper? Now, I had a lot of comments on this, but you'd be surprised. Um, there are tons of men that wear girdles uh, to keep the, to keep the belly in. Because, like I said, you know, when you're younger and everything, it's all up here. You walk around like Rambo and all, and then the older you get, that thing starts to slide down, poop, you know, there goes the stomach and all of that, and especially the older you get, the more your uh, metabolism slows down and all kind of things happen, just like women go through a change of life, men go through certain kind of changes, I'm in my midlife, and when you're in your midlife, sometimes, you know, you, the women, they go through midlife, and they go through those mood swings and all, and sometimes those of us as men, uh, when we hit a certain age, you just you just wake up feeling grumpy. You just feel grumpy. You don't feel like being nice. You don't feel like smiling. You know, how's your day going? How you think it's going? You know, you just you're just grumpy for no reason. Don't hate anybody. Not upset with anybody. Not mad. Not angry. Somebody asked me the other day, "Are you upset with me?" I said, "I don't have time to be upset. All this traveling I'm doing, running the jurisdiction, running a thriving church, have a wonderful family, uh, leading a national." 
uh, organization and, and uh, working in the city with the clergy coalition and so many things going on. I don't have time to be upset anybody, but sometimes you all know how it is when you hit those um, mid age. You just you, you know certain things going on in your body and everything like that, and you just uh, just feel grumpy at times. Um, that's all a part of life. That's that's the joys of getting older. That's the joys of uh, being in life. But you never def you definitely don't want to be mean, evil, and hateful. You want to be uh, godly. But um, <laughs> a lot of people said girdles for men. There's a lot of men that wear girdles, and there's a lot of people wear body shapers. Again, that goes to the motive of the heart. There's nothing wrong with again taking pride in yourself, wanting to look good. And, and really, even for married folks, you should not stop trying to look good for your spouse just because you got married. You know, before you got married, you tried to impress your spouse and, um, you know, look good for it and everything. Now you don't care. Go around in raggedy underclothes and everything like that and smelly and don't, you know, fix yourself up. Uh, something is wrong with that. You, want, you definitely want to just look good for yourself, look good for your spouse. Uh, but again, it goes back to your motive. As representatives of the Lord, we always want to look our best. Uh, we also should discipline. We should have disciplined lives. People treat you different based on how you dress. I remember one time I went into a store. Um, this was years ago. This might have been 30-some-odd years ago, and I was in some raggedy jeans and something like that. And, you know, um, how you doing, young man? You know, that's kind of the response I got. I remember going into the store the next time I had my three-piece suit and all. Uh, how are you, sir? You know, and I said, oh, just the difference, just by how I uh, dress. And realize this, the clothes don't make you, you make the clothes. You know, if you don't have confidence in yourself, it doesn't matter. You can be in a $2,000, uh, $2,500 tailored suit, you know, $500 shoes, $300 tie, $250 shirt, it doesn't matter. If you if you don't make the clothes, you know, those, those clothes are definitely not going to make you. Um, but you should have some kind of pride in yourself. You should try to look your best. We should also live disciplined lives. Again, looking your best and being a sex symbol are two totally different things. It's never proper for a man or woman of God, minister or laity, to try to be a sex symbol. Proverbs 23, 1 and 2, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're a man of great appetite. So the scripture talks about discipline. We should have some discipline. And again, you know, we want to look our best, but we should also have some discipline. Proverbs 23 and 20. Don't, do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or gluttonous eaters of meat. Um, so gluttony, that's about the same as, um, you know, someone that does all of this drinking, all of this uh, drinking that people do. You know, there's people that when times are, they get stressed out, they, they run to the bottle, they run to the dope. There's other people, they run to the buffet. And so we want to make sure that we're not using food as a crutch. Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is more deceitful than all these, and who is and is desperately sick, who can understand it? So it all goes back to the motive. 2 Timothy 3, 5 through 6, watch these preachers trying to be sex symbols. It says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Avoid such people, it says, for among them, those that enter into households and captivate silly women. Silly women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. So tonight, I won't have a chance to uh, hold you as long as I normally do, and that's one reason why I started earlier. But hopefully tonight we've answered that question in regard uh, uh, to you that have asked that question as far as weight loss surgery and things like that. Again, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It belongs to God. That is not your body. It belongs to him. So you can't just go, you know, just like how I was the pastor of that uh, church. It was owned by uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and because it was owned by Memphis, Tennessee, even though we had the money, we couldn't do any renovations on that church unless we got permission to do it. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. And if your body belongs to God, then you should seek him uh, for direction. And don't just do something just because everybody is doing, doing it. Because, you know, there are people that have literally died from weight loss surgery. They've died from going in and getting uh, implants and things like that. Um, so you should really seek God in regard to that. No surgery is, my, well, it's just a minor surgery. Anything can go wrong with surgery. You know, anything can go wrong with that. Um, anything can happen with that. So it's important that you really be careful. And again, you don't want to get the tummy tuck. You don't want to get the weight loss surgery and go right back to the buffet. There was, um, there's been people that have actually, uh, I think it's a sleeve that they get that they put on their stomach. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of people that get that sleeve on their stomach. They keep on going and 
running to the restaurants and eating all of what they want to eat, and there's been people that the thing is busted, and uh, they go right back to where they came from. And so, we, again, we don't want to use uh, quick fixes. I'll take a few minutes to answer some questions. I'm cutting. I'm getting this gut tucked. You hear me? Okay. All right. Sister uh, Taylor Shante saying, I don't care what you say. I'm getting this thing cut. I'm getting this gut cut. Okay. God bless your heart. Praying for you. Does that mean no tattoos after you give your life to Jesus Christ? That's a whole different lesson that I'm going to be dealing with. I have that lesson uh, coming up, and I'm going to be dealing with tattoos because, again, there's so many people doing things and not even really trying to find the origin of where it came from. You're doing it just because everybody's doing it. And nowadays, people just really throw up their hand to, to God, and they're like, hey, you know, as long as I feel good about this, it doesn't matter what anybody says, and I don't have to be bound by anybody's interpretation of Scripture. But again, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You can't just do what you want to do with your body. You cannot do that. You can't sleep with who you want to sleep with. You cannot put in your body what you just want to put into it. It belongs to God, and you must get God's permission before you do anything to alter uh, this body, especially when it comes to major surgery where you could end up, if something goes wrong, losing your life. And so we must seek God. And so I'm going to pray with you and pray for you. And speaking of prayer, weight loss surgery is just a tool, must change your lifestyle. Yeah, and the way you eat, that is correct. And uh, some people have to do it because of their um, uh, certain health conditions and things like that. I want to pray with you before I go into service. I'm actually getting ready to go into service and preach. I feel like preaching. My God. Woo, I feel that anointing right now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to be preaching from the message tonight. Satan has some power, but God has all power. Last night I ministered in Wichita, Kansas, from the subject, The Importance of the Preacher. This week in Revival, I'm going to be ministering uh, here in D.C. Uh, um, from the subject, another subject I'll be preaching, If I Could Be a Fly on the Wall. Friday night, I'm going to be preaching Williams Temple. Uh, uh, their jurisdictional holy convocation, Eastern Missouri, Western Illinois. Everybody in St. Louis, get there with me. We're going to have a time in the Lord. My subject matter is God, I'm burned out. Set me on fire again. Glory to God. So if you desire to be set on fire spiritually now, uh, come and join us at Williams Temple on Friday night with Bishop Wooten, our uh, general board member in the area. We thank God for all of you, and I appreciate you. Now, here's what I'm asking that you would do. I know I've been kind of a little shorter these past couple weeks. One reason is, of course, Houston, Texas last week, D.C. this week. i got to check the calendar to see where I'm at uh, next week. And I just thank God for open doors. I haven't had to call anybody going to 20 different jurisdictions in the next uh, month or so, and uh, God has opened up these doors, and I praise God for it and proclaiming his word uh, I'm stepping on toes, but this is good. <laughs> hey, I'm j just just going as, as the Lord. We just want to seek the Lord. I, I, you know, I don't have the answers. That's why I don't call myself the Bible Answer Man. You know, there's another program with that title. I take you to the Word, and then you let God speak to you and lead you and guide you and direct you as far as what you're to do. Because we're just doing so many things just to do it, just because everybody's doing it. And we're not really considering God. And we're wondering why we're not blessed. We're wondering why things aren't happening. Um, speaking of being blessed, I need each and every one of you to keep me in prayer. I am recruiting 1,000 prayer warriors, 1,000 prayer warriors to pray for me. If you are praying for me, send me an inbox message. Let me know that you're praying. I will be glad to also add you to our um, uh, text blast list, email list. As Deacon Colts is listing right here, uh, later tonight you'll be able to go to the blog and get the notes the notes are found on every time I turn around dot blogspot dot com. That's every time I turn around dot blogspot dot com. Uh, that's where you'll be able to find the notes, and uh, we know that God is going to bless you. Listen, I need to get into the sanctuary. It's preaching time. My God, I feel His anointing, and I'm looking forward to those that God is going to bless and sanctify and fill with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I tell you, there is a mighty move of God. In the land. How many sense that even during the Pentecost Sunday, you sense that God is doing something great? We had an awesome packed out Pentecost service for Missouri Midwest. We've been having tremendous services um, at Life Center as well. We are a Pentecostal church and God has richly blessed us. No, I don't have a live webcast during our service because, you know, a Pentecostal expression doesn't always work out on a on a webcast. And so we, of course, do the teaching here. And I ask that you, again, would please share this. Will you do that? Will you please like this page, share this page, subscribe, 
That's what I'm asking that you would do. Help me to spread the gospel across the country and around the world. I see you all are praying. And, and, and uh, listen, uh, I know you're praying for me, but I want you to pray for me right now. Do it right now. I need 1,000 people, and that's what I'm recruiting all over the place, 1,000 people that will pray uh, for your brother. Pray for Brother Hankerson. Please do that. Uh, we're asking that you would do that because I can sense a mighty move of God. That was the key to Charles Finney and many people, uh, Charles Spurgeon and those that God used in tremendous manners. It wasn't so much their eloquence, you know, but it was the power of prayer. The saints were praying for them. And I need 1,000 people uh, to pray for me. I'm recruiting you right now. And uh, I'll tell you where we're at as far as the number, but all around the nation, folks are interceding, and God is moving. He is breaking some things. He is moving some things forward, and it is just exciting to see what God is doing in this season. Well, Bishop Coles is waiting for me, and I'm getting ready to head to the pulpit right now here in Washington, D.C. If you know anybody in the area, they can join me at 6440 Piney Branch Road, the historic New Bethel Church of God in Christ. Bishop Cole is the pastor Hopefully, each and every one of you got your questions somewhat answered uh, from the scriptures that we have shared, and we appreciate it so much. That's it. I thank you. I see you, Brother Corbin, praying for me. I see you. Amen. Deacon Cole's praying for you. All right. They're coming to get me at this time. Until next time, every time we turn around, God is blessing us in the live video on, uh, what is this, Instagram and share it. God bless your heart. Appreciate you all so much. See you next time. Until next time, every time we turn around, God is.